Bonjour. Hello, everybody. It's so great to um, be with you and talk to you. It's been so long. I've been in my physics cave for so long, um, and I'm finally coming out. We have so much exciting stuff happening. Uh, so much has happened in the last year and a half. And um, the theory and the work, the theoretical work and the technological work we are uh, been working on is, is starting to emerge. We're starting this relationship with you. We want to bring you along. We want to connect with you. We want to uh, start this amazing journey with you. And so I was looking at the physics we were writing and we got deep into the physics um, and we started to see like the emergence of an amazing unification of all of physics, all constants, all scales, all forces unified. And um, we got deep into it and I realized as I dug in that like I hadn't really um, published papers that were understood um, and that uh, the papers I published made huge assumptions. And that one of the assumptions I made was that because I'm an autodidact and I studied independently that, um, you know, the physics uh, that I had studied were understood by all physicists. And I realized actually that's not the case. And, and so it, my papers were not quite understood. Like, and since those papers weren't quite understood, um, the papers I was about to publish were not going to be understand, understood neither. So I figured I better publish a paper that slowly, you know, lays the ground for what's coming, like this 200 page, more like a book uh, that's gonna emerge uh, in the next few months, but, the, but that I needed a paper that was gonna be a precursor to the book and that was gonna explain deeply the, the history, but as well show uh, the solutions that I give, the physics that I gave earlier, how when you write the details of it and how uh, you can emerge from it, the physics of a unified field theory and a unified view of physics. And so we uh, wrote this paper. It's going to come out in the next few weeks. And it um, basically it's called The Origin of Mass and the nature of gravity. And so it basically goes through uh, a really deep level of the emergence of fields. Um, and what I mean by that forces and mass and, um, and constants in physics at the deepest level. So it's the first step. So, so this is the first step I want to share with you today. And it, it, I, we're going to do this really quick, so it, it's not going to be in enough details for you to understand it all. We're just going to do with the hands kind of like this is kind of how it works. And but we are offering to as well, like give you a seminar, uh, like have a seminar in the next few uh, months. So in September, I think the at the end of September it will be the English. Uh, seminar and the French one at the beginning of October and then as well we have a technical seminar that's only going to be jargon um, that is going to be for the scientists this is a free seminar for the scientists and then a two-day seminar for the layman uh, to explain this paper that's going to come out and it has profound implication as well throughout this last year and a half there's been changes in my organizations we've moved from california and all this and so i'm gonna present this to you today starting with our ceo sarah astle which is gonna explain to you this new organization called isf or international space federation so sarah take it over hello and welcome Thank you to all of you joining us live and to you tuning in later to our recording. 
My name is Sarah Astles. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of our organizations, and I'm here with Thibaut Verbest, our Chief Legal Officer. My name is Thibaut Verbest. I am a lawyer, and I am the Chief Legal Officer of the ISF. I would like to share with you something that we are about to launch. You know our organizations as the Resident Science Foundation and Taurus Tech. We are excited to announce that we are taking these companies to the next level. Introducing the International Space Federation. The International Space Federation, or ISF, stands on the shoulders of all the companies that came before it. It brings together the education, research, and technology developed over the past 35 years through physicist Nassim Haramein and his team of scientists and engineers. ISF marks a new step in human evolution. A deeper understanding of the nature of reality through the unification of physics and science generates a direct engineering path to significant energy production, from the structure of quantum vacuum fluctuations to the alteration and control of the space-time curvature to yield gravity control. ISF is the first space agency dedicated to the development of these liberating technologies that will birth humanity into a new way of interacting with nature at the most fundamental level and bring us to a sustainable world with true space-bound capabilities. Imagine a world that doesn't depend on fossil fuels and having access to unlimited off-planet resources. So um, this crazy adventure that we're in, this amazing transformation, I think, that is going on around the world today um, is really forcing and, and, and putting a stressor on society to evolve, to transform, to, to transcend. And, and there's transcendence that's emerging as well from the scientific community. And uh, what I mean by that is that there's all kinds of new sets of data that are coming in and, and um, different sets of research that are coming in that are really bringing science and forcing science in some ways to, to move to the next level of understanding and comprehension. And, and I wanted to share with you some of that science today. Um, the James Webb Telescope and the, the data that's coming back is starting to show clearly and some scientists are starting to talk that way that uh, the universe obeys the condition of a black hole and that we might be living in a black hole. It's something I've been discussing for many, many years. Uh, there is scientists that are talking about the protons and atoms being mini black holes and so on. And, and there is very deep level of, um, of science that is being re-examined. And, and we're going to do some of that together today. And I wanted to invite uh, some of my colleagues uh, that have been working with me diligently for the last few years, in some cases, um, on these um, fundamental physics. Uh, one of them being uh, Olivier Allerol, which is sitting with me today. Hello, everyone. So good to have you here, Olivier. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah, and I'm uh, as well uh, sitting here with um, uh, Cyprien Guermont-Pré, which uh, just joined our team. Uh, hello, everyone. Very glad to be here, yeah, here today. It's great to have you. And it's great to be able to share this with the public. So I wanted you guys to introduce yourself a little bit. Maybe Olivier, if you want to start. Yeah. So uh, before meeting Nassim, I graduated from uh, USPC. It's an engineering school in Paris, which is fam famous because uh, its a laboratory hosted several uh, Nobel Prize physicists like uh, Marie Curie, uh, George Charpak, or Pierre Gilles de Gênes. And uh, after that, I did my PhD um, at the CEA Grenoble. Uh, it's a national French lab research center um, working on uh, atomic physics. And um, after that, I'm, uh, I started working uh, with Nassim in 2016. And since then, it's been a very intense roller coaster, <laughs> during which uh, I learned uh, how um, Archaeology and uh, humankind history is uh, tightly linked to um, 
to fundamental physics, which can be kind of surprising at first. And, uh, and also, like, I, I learned that um, while I was thinking, I, I was uh, very well prepared to tackle any physical question when I first met Nassim. Uh, I quickly realized that unifying physics wasn't like a quick and easy task. <laughs> <laughs> Even when uh, you listen to Nassim conference, it looks like so easy, so simple and so clear. When you need to go deep into the details of the um, fundamental concepts in physics, it's no, uh, yeah, it takes quite a long time and uh, it's been a long journey. And I'm very glad to be here tonight to start uh, sharing a part, of, a part of it. It's been a long journey, but it's been exciting too, no? We had so many moments of... I mean, you don't express emotion as much as I do, but <laughs> we had so many moments of really amazing discoveries, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very a process with different parts, because uh, some of it you can find like kind of quickly some answers and then start the long scientific process of validation. For example, in 2019, we already had a big part of the scaling law theory mm -hmm. and uh, then started the long process of verification and uh, questioning why is it so simple and so beautiful? Are we all right? Uh, is there any mistakes? Why no one else found it before us? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been quite a journey, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, in some ways, it's not like we've discovered anything new. Um, we we kind of like took what was already there and rearranged it in some ways. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice, uh, a nice analogy. It's uh, like physics is like a big puzzle, mm -hmm. and uh, along these years, all the pieces, the main pieces, are uh, were were discovered and out there. Um, everyone can play with it. But the difficult part and one big part that you, that you did, Nassim, was to, uh, to put the link between all these species. And, uh, and we simply put all these species together and, which we, uh, and the process is kind of more simple for us and for others because you have the, the, the overview. Mm -hmm. You know what, you have the big picture. And when you have the big picture, and it's like a, like that for every puzzle. It's simpler to find <laughs> where each piece is, needs to go. Yeah, exactly. That's great. That's a great analogy. And Cyprien. Yes. Cyprien, you've been here with us for a few months now. Yes. And I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed how fast you caught on, how fast you went through all the math and the physics, because Olivier and I have been writing for five years, six years. Uh, all this math and physics and uh, you know, there's like hundreds and hundreds thousands of pages, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. all the notes and everything and you just absorbed everything. Uh, yes. It was it amazing. Was, it was quite intense. Yeah. Last yeah. month and uh, I think I've clearly benefits from your work and for your uh, work on the simplification of the concept such that we can understand it quite quickly and I think this is what we will start to do for the next months. Yes, yeah. exactly. For the rest of people. Yeah. And now that it's clear and it's done, it's yeah. easier to absorb. Yeah. So exactly. tell us about your life path. Yeah. So I I did my um, uh, undergraduate studies in science uh, at Ecole Polytechnique uh, in France, Paris. Uh, it's one of the top level university in France for science and technology. Uh, one example is that um, last year Nobel Prize Alain Aspé uh, went to Ecole Polytechnique and also taught there. Um, it was a Nobel Prize on quantum entanglement, uh, so one of the main topics we are studying here at ISF. After that I did a one-year master's in the uh, University of Cambridge in UK and then I went back to Ecole Polytechnique in Paris for my PhD in uh, fluid dynamics. So it was in physics applied to uh, fluids at the micro scale. And uh, surprisingly, when I joined ISF, I discovered that space time and fluid dynamics has very much in common. And uh, after my PhD, I, did, uh, I founded a, a company in biotech and then I joined ISF. And uh, 
the main motivation for me to join ISF was the fact that um, in addition to the uh, fundamental physics together, we also tried to find links in what have been discovered over the, the past century. And um, for me, it was so interesting to be at the edge of the knowledge in science. Mm -hmm. And also that this edge of knowledge could um, then lead to new technologies and that could address the, the, the current problems of our world. And uh, for me, it was very meaningful to, to do so, I mean, to start this the journey with you, yeah. Right exactly. on. Yeah. yeah, what a journey. Mm. Cambridge, how was Cambridge? Yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, for me, it was a gathering of people from all around the world with very uh, different backgrounds. And also, they are really good to mix the backgrounds uh, between the students. And also, it's very, I mean, it's one of the top universities in the world. So. Uh, you have very good teachers and a lot of good research and they are really focused on the research so even over one year masters you do six months of research wow. which was very um, important for me then uh, to continue in the research world right 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 so this is the quality of the researchers that are starting to be involved in ISF so if we go to the presentation this is my chance to introduce you to ISF, um, International Space Federation. This is, uh, this is where we're going. This is where we're at. Um, we started a uh, space agency, basically, but I didn't call it an agency because it doesn't belong to a country. It belongs to the world, to humanity. So I called it a federation, like the federation of all countries. Um, and so this uh, space uh, federation is like a, the first space agency that's going full force for gravity control and the extraction of energy from vacuum fluctuation. Because although we do a lot of theory, and uh, we can get busy with all the mathematics, all this leads to very straightforward application to technology and fundamental transformative technology. Uh, technology like no technology has emerged since some of the biggest discoveries that were made, like, you know, the flight or uh, the computer or you know, big steps that were made in the human evolution. Um, since almost a hundred and some years, um, since the discovery of relativity, Max uh, Planck with uh, quantum mechanics and, and Maxwell, you know, with electromagnetic fields and so on, um, which led to really profound changes in the technology we utilize today. Um, they, there's been kind of a, a long time, a long desert, you know, of, of technological uh, evolution that would be like profound um, in terms of society. Like there's, you know, improvement on what we did before. Right. Yeah. But I mean, think of the car, for instance, you know, the 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 cars, uh, even electric cars, which you could say, wow, you know, that's a big step from combustion engine, you know, carnal engines to, to electric motors. Well, some of the first cars that were made a hundred years ago were electric, electric though. So, you know, it's actually been there all along. And so, um, you know, same thing with rockets, the way we go to space, um, and the way we consider, um, you know, the, of course, you know, advancements in computing, advancements in communication have occurred and so on, but nothing truly fundamental since then, correct? Yeah, yeah. In fact, when, when you look at fundamental physics, each fundamental uh, theory in physics led to a um, great application. Like you said, Maxwell led to all the microelectronics we know, all the telecommunication we know, and uh, condensed matter physics led to 
microelectronics and uh, the optics one to mechanics le led to laser and optics. But the recent modern uh, fundamental physics, like the standard model and, um, and particle physics in general, and led to nothing. Mm. There are no, the X mechanism, like the understanding, their understanding of the mass, the, uh, didn't lead to uh, gravity control mm -hmm. or any fundamental application. Mm -hmm. And when you look at all the recent uh, technologies we have, even quantum computing, comes from all theories from the beginning of, la of the last century. Exactly. But all the recent modern uh, physics theory didn't lead to any modern applications. And that's a good sign that they, they are not very good, te very, very good te uh, theory. Theory, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, application and string theory really, you know, kind of nosedived uh, at one point where it really didn't lead to any fundamental understanding of mass, energy, gravity, um, quantum yeah. gravity, okay. or any of this. I mean, there was some advancements, but um, the mechanisms and the formalism was um, not um leading to anything that can have concrete you know application yeah. in our world and a, uh, and a good identification is that when a theory is good it's because it explains really how nature works and basically it's like biomimeting when we understand how nature work we can replicate it at our scale and use it uh, for our technology right so uh in our case we, you know, where the Higgs mechanism, for instance, predicts 1% the mass of the proton. And, you know, then when you put all the protons together in the universe, you only predict 4% of the mass of the universe. The rest is some unknown material that we call dark matter and dark energy. Um, our theory, what we've written now, um, predicts 100% of the mass uh, both of the proton which is the you know the mass of the atoms if you'd like um, because the electron is neg neg negligible in in the mass of the universe but as well predicts correctly the mass of the universe when we scale the equations to the universal size so and 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 i know that like my papers in the past have been difficult to understand or not clear at all and you know clearly people didn't get it in the scientific community as much as i would have liked to get it some people got it but um but others then uh, a majority didn't and it's the way it was written you know i'm a notodidact i come from a completely different angle and i studied 30 years so i did study <laughs> physics in details however uh, I assume that uh, certain sets of knowledge were uh, widely known amongst physicists, and that was the wrong assumption. So I, I wrote my papers with these assumptions in mind, and that's why it wasn't clear. Um, and so what I realized as I was, you know, working on this paper with Olivier, with Cyprien, is that, listen, we need to make a paper which is like the entry of this theory like and that like sets the base of the work that I've done before but as well gives the details um, enough that people can really relate to it and that was really important to do and so this is the paper we're finishing now it's uh, it's gonna be ready in the next few weeks and uh, it's called um, it's called the origin of mass and the nature of gravity and so this is um, like a paper that really um, uh, explains at a deep level where mass emerges from and how it leads to gravitational fields and so on. And um, I think that it's really important that I mention as well that what I'm going to present to you today is a layman presentation. There's a lot of equations, um, so stay calm, don't panic, it's gonna be okay. Uh, and there's not enough equations for the scientific community to be able to like get um, 
everything they need from from what I'm going to present tonight. Uh, they'll get that in the paper and they'll get that in a presentation uh, seminar of uh, three hours that we're going to do in September for the scientific community. Um, but I'm going to try to give like the fundamental um, concepts of what we've written or general ideas of what we're written and where we're coming from, basically kind of showing you where things kind of got put in the wrong places or unrelated places where they needed to be related. So we're going to go through it the best we can. So again, it's with the hands, you know, um, the rigorous uh, proof of what we're talking about is going to be in the paper. So um, if you're a scientific and you, if you're a physicist and you don't, you're not getting enough to be able to um, get what you need to, to confirm what I'm saying, don't panic. It's coming out. It's going to be there and we'll be able to discuss it together in um, a technical seminar in September. And the, all the people out there that want to know what it means and uh, more layman information and all this, we're going to do a, uh, a seminar as well at the beginning of October, end of September, beginning of September, only for you guys. And that one's going to be two days, like one night and one day. Uh, weekend and it will be you know amazing it's gonna be awesome because I'll be able to talk to you about the the technical part but as well talk to you about the implication of that um, theory and the work that's been done and the work that's been done in the laboratory on the hardware because people don't necessarily know but I've been working in laboratory for some 20 years um, and um, on hardware and so on as well. So let's start. Um, one of the most famous equation um, and uh, that most people know uh, is the equation that uh, relates uh, momentum and mass uh, in special relativity. And so, um, you want to describe it a little bit, Olivier? Oh, or Cyprien. Cyprien. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, the, the, the major shift uh, brought by Einstein was to switch from uh, the concept of mass to the concept of energy. And uh, he defined the, the energy as the sum between the momentum and the rest mass energy. Meaning that if I have a particle or an object with a mass m, he has its own energy, but as soon as he starts to move, it will have an additional energy such that it's better to define um, a system with its energy rather than its mass because they realize that by moving you have different behavior than if you stay um, at the stationary. St stationary yes and but when we focus only on the mass because we want we wanted to understand the origin of mass and the origin of the the energy uh, what we realized that the proper definition of mass uh, wasn't provided by this equation. Right, so, because there's undefined characters yes, in exactly. the equation. <laughs> so basically by analyzing this equation, this famous equation, we realized that energy wasn't properly defined, uh, the mass of the system was not properly defined, and also the, 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 the light velocity was not properly defined. I mean we can measure it in space-time, we can have a, a numerical value, but why is this value is uh, set to uh, uh, the, the value we measure and why it's not lower or higher? And mm -hmm. this was very puzzling. Why is the speed of light the speed of light? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, but, but most critically, that part, the m in the middle of E equals mc square, that m is really kind of an enigma. Mm. What is that? What is mass? You know, People hear that word, they, uh, they use it, they, they use it in equations everywhere. Einstein tried to figure it out. He said, well, there's an equivalence. And, and so we're not dissing Einstein's equation. It's beautiful equation of equivalence. It's, it's amazing that he was able to come up with that, which he came up with like some basic instinctive 
thoughts about it. It's uh, it wasn't necessarily from like analytical, uh, you know, derivations that he came up with this. Um, it led to that, but um, but initially it was thought process about the nature of reality, and all of a sudden uh, you see this equivalence, but you realize that. And this is something that even physicists um, may not realize is that we really don't know what is equal here, like what's equivalent. We, we don't, since we don't know what mass is and we don't know why C is going at C, um, that means that the left side of the equation, E or the energy, is not clear what is energy, right? Energy is something that produces work in the universe. We know that. It, if you have energy, you can get work done if it's organized, if it's directed properly. But what is that that we call energy? And if we don't know fundamentally what is that, what is mass, what is energy, then there is no way we can harmonize our technology to the way energy flows or energy is created in the universe. We, we would extract energy from different source, like extracting the energy from the gravitational potential of water falling through a turbine from a lake, you know, hydroelectric power is one way to to get the energy out, right? Uh, it came from the gravitational field, but as we'll see, gravity is not clear neither in physics. And so, you know, you can extract it by breaking um, nuclear of atoms and, and creating fission and, and producing a lot of heat. And with that heat, boiling water uh, and, uh, and then using that steam to turn turbines and get power but um it's not so efficient and uh the result can have nasty consequences and so this is um you know we're using the energy we don't really know what it is and we we are not able to find a way to like tap into the energy at its source like before it's something before it's like an atom or it's a lake somewhere or or something else or 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 coal that took thousands and thousands and thousands of years to be generated in the in the earth and and then we have to pull it out and then we burn it and and the efficiency is not that great, and then we create all kinds of other issues. So all this is really kind of critical that we understand. So I don't want to take too much time on this because I'm, I'm already in trouble, but let's, let's just keep going. So this equation um, didn't have gravity in it. So that, that was missing. So Einstein thought, well, you know, how do I generalize this equation? So from special uh, relativity, he moved to general relativity, where he generalized the equation by adding g in the equation. He, he, um, he added the, the concept of gravity in the equation. Uh, sorry, my slide was not in the right sequence there, but I wanted to show you this equation which is the solution to Einstein field equation. Um, and the metrical part is right here. You want to say something about it, Olivier? Yeah, so in uh, Einstein field equation, you have two parts. The, the right part re represents the stress energy tensor, which is the energy density of the, the system you are stu studying. This part. Yeah, and uh, it's the, the, the part representing the mass of the object. And like before, it's undefined. So T nu mu is the mass here. This is Einstein's constant. Yeah. Yep. And the left part is the, the way uh, the, the stress energy tensor is curving space. Mm -hmm. So the, the left part is uh, the, 
the DS line, the, the space-time curvature. So Einstein said basically, gravity is not something that's being produced by the object itself. It's the object influencing the structure of space around it. Yeah, yeah. And, and so basically the concept, so you can see, uh, let me just go to the next. Uh, you can see that if we arrange the solution to Einstein, the Schwarzschild solution here, uh, which gives a black hole, by the way, like it, the solution to Einstein's equation for gravity produce a black hole in the equation, which has a singularity in the middle that, you know, has an infinite amount of energy, but that's another story. Um, but what you can recognize in this equation when you rearrange it is that it's uh, similar to special relativity is uh, has the new component of gravity, which in this case he described as this curvature of space time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And one big part that was missing in this kind, in this interpretation of this equation is that mass curves space time, but in return. Um, it wasn't clear at that time, and not even today for most of the physicists, that space-time, cu the curvature of space-time could create mass. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's why we put these arrows here. So mass curves space-time, which is this side of the equation, the, the stress-energy tensor, uh, cur curves the metrical side. And But the metrical side, you know, it says... So, you know, to be clear, in standard physics, it says how mass is moving, how the object is moving, because the curvature says how fast it's going to be attracted it's and it's the, geodesic the and all this. So it tells how mass it's moving, but it doesn't tell where mass comes from. Yeah, exactly. it, it doesn't tell you what. It, and then furthermore, even more importantly, it doesn't tell us anything about space-time. Yes, exactly. So th this equation from uh, Einstein on general relativity is mainly a geometrical uh, equation, but do not um, provide any uh, hints on the, the physical aspect of space-time. And I think this is the main limitation of this uh, equation or the interpretation of this equation. And uh, this is what we are going to try to demonstrate uh, to you with the hands today, is how this space-time can be interpreted uh, with a physical uh, meaning. Yeah, when you say try to demonstrate today, is we're just going to show it really quickly. Exactly. exactly. But yeah, I just want to make clear as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We've it, solved those equations, and it's correct. We'll, yeah. It will be coming to you. With the hands, yeah. Yeah, right. Today we <laughs> do with show the show the concept. <laughs> yeah, show the concept. And, uh, you know, it's it's really important to understand. I was I was really excited when Cyprian um, joined our team because um, Olivier and I were finding that space-time acts, well, you know, Einstein field equation really actually describes space-time in fluid dynamics in at a deeper level but it, but that it's a real fluid that it, it's it currently it's thought to be a mathematical construct and uh, you know that gives the correct answer and 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 we want to be clear einstein field equations is correct um and uh e equals mc square is correct it's just that it's not complete and and most Physicists will agree to that. And the same thing for quantum mechanics. And we were able to find how to complete them, how to connect them, how to make them work together so that we understand, oh, that's how the, work, the universe works and at a really deep level. And when you do that, well, then you have basically a roadmap to how to engineer gravity or mass. Um, you know, just like when Maxwell wrote Maxwell's equations, what's called Maxwell's equations today, his equations of electromagnetic fields, it gave the roadmap on how to use, you know, those equations to engineer stuff to control electromagnetic fields. So it's it's really kind of the same thing. So I was really excited when Cyprian mis, uh, 
you know, came and worked with us because Cyprien did work and uh, in fluid dynamics and actually microfluid dynamics. Yeah, right? yeah, three, uh, yeah. I did, so during my PhD, I was studying uh, nano droplets. So it was free dynamics at a very small scale. And uh, what is the parallel that we can make with uh, general relativity is that at the macro scale with fluids, you have two forces that are in competition, which is the surface tension and the uh, um, yeah the stress tensor uh, viscosity yeah the, the viscosity, viscosity yeah. of the fluid and uh, in the Einstein field equation, what we can notice is uh, that on the right part we have a pressure term, which is the the energy density, and uh, the relationship between this pressure term and the way we curve a fluid is called the surface tension. So in Einstein field equation, we can find some parallel with free dynamics, which was very interesting for me. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. So, um, so think of it as like water in your bath, you know, and you pull the plug and the water is going down and your rubber ducky is starting to be attracted to the drain. Um, Einstein described gravity as like the surface of the water going down. Think of it that way. And in our case, um, what we found is that, well, you know, that's just the surface of a fluid. Uh, actually, the fluid of space-time is actually made of grains, just like the water is made out of atoms. And we found the size of those grains and how they behave to produce the force. It's all those grains of atoms spinning in your bath together that makes the fluid that makes the effect and we kind of we found those dynamics. Yeah. So, um, so this um, leads to trying to understand Einstein better, to un understand those equations better, the nature of space-time. And when we look at the nature of space-time, we see that the mass, um, you know, and the gravitational component, um, they generate a radius. So that's the Schwarzschild radius, the radius of the black hole it produced. So I want to clarify as well that when we use Einstein field equations, in most cases, uh, for calculating orbitals of planets or, or the movement of galaxies and all this, we're actually using equation that says all these things are black holes. Like, you know, that's inherent in the equation. Um, and when you describe a black hole, uh, there's something in the math that happens, it's called a divergence, and that is that when you're getting to the middle of the thing, in the middle of the black hole, you get, uh, there we go, Whoop. Uh, on l'avait pas mis, we didn't put it, but in the middle of the black hole, I thought we did it, but we forgot it, um, but in the middle of the black hole is a little point that has infinite density, like it's called a singularity. And when we, we get to that point, uh, space-time seems to curve to infinity, and, and as a result, the density of the mass seems to go to infinity. And so the equation gives you a radius, but if, if the start of your radius is an infinite distance, then you can't really get a real radius. So, so actually more accurately, and I'm just saying with the hands here, I'm not saying um, Schwarzschild solution is wrong. I'm just saying with the hands, clearly the Schwarzschild solution should be described as a circumference. So like if you do the equivalence, you get, you know, to put two pi on the radius side. So you're describing a circumference. Yeah, but basically because uh, the notion of radius doesn't exist uh, in um, Einstein field equation mm -hmm. because you have a singularity at the middle, so you can't define really a radius. So you have a, a pseudo radius defined by the, the circumference of a circle. And what we, we were uh, showing here with the hands, it's showing like how the, the curvature uh, in 2D uh, in the middle or 3D uh, on the right uh, is represented uh, by the, um, the stress energy tensor on, on the right, which is the, which is the mass. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you do that with the hand, you find the, 
again the Einstein uh, constant uh, represented by the the Newton Newtonian constant G. Right. So you so when you do the circle, you you correctly find Einstein's uh, constant yeah. that he had to put on the side of the stress energy tensor to make the equation work out. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And so, um, so this is uh, this kind of technical, but it's important um, because all of a sudden you get a different picture um, because all of a sudden instead of a radius, which is kind of a linear way to think, and it's and we'll see in a minute in the beginning of quantum mechanics, we start thinking about oscillators as as springs, where you know, maybe it should have been something spinning. Um, the the idea of having two pi on the radius side starts to talk to you about rotation. It starts to talk to you about angular momentum, about spin. And, um, and, and think of it this way. And again, it's very general what I'm saying. We have these equations to demonstrate this. Think of it this way, when space-time spin, it makes mass, so that it goes from the left side of the equation to the right side of the equation. It actually produces energy in space that radiates, and that radiation is what we call mass. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that for now and go to the next slide. And now we're jumping to another part of physics completely. It's, it was happening at the same time. Meanwhile, while Einstein is writing relativity in those years, right? Uh, Max Planck is studying um, light bulbs, right? Um, he's trying to figure out a very fundamental uh, thermodynamic equations, um, literally to make a better filament for light bulbs, uh, and and um, and when you at the time you tried to solve these equations, you had to use a concept that's called a black body. Okay, so that might sound really close to a black hole, and that's because it is. Um, although these things have not been related, uh, a black hole is almost a perfect black body, and a black body is a is a concept of a box or some object that would absorb all the photons incident on it, right? Mm. Like uh, dark genes, black genes heat up, you know, because they're absorbing. Uh, and when they heat up, they radiate. So he was trying to figure out out of that black body, you know, the, the light bulb being coming black, um, how the the thermodynamics or the electromagnetic field that would radiate from this object, right? Yeah, right. Actually, they, they were doing this experiment since the middle of the 19th century where they radiate um, uh, a system or an object with a certain mass and temperature and look at what, what, what type of light they could uh, receive in response. And this very simple experiment provided a very deep understanding of how the matter is constructed. And uh, Max Planck spent many years trying to describe this mechanism of how the matter is be behaving while we irradiate it with, uh, with photons. And what we can see on the, on the graph on the right hand side is uh, this energy spectrum. And one so of the, the spectrum of the heat that would be radiated, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. The electromagnetic field that would yeah. be radiated. So fun what, what we see is function of the temperature in Kelvin here. It's the K that you can read on the, on the graph. Yeah. Uh, you have different colors. And maybe some of you have noticed on their uh, bulb, uh, light bulb at home that uh, sometimes you have a temperature on the light bulb. It doesn't mean that the, your light bulb will reach the 4 thousand K, K temperature. Uh, yeah, it's exactly. a temperature of the color of the emanation of the exactly, light bulb. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So exactly. it's kind of funny because you see light bulbs nowadays, uh, you know, that are sold and they, they show you, you know, it's a 4,000 K light bulb, hmm. you know, and it gives you the temperature of the 
the color. The color, yeah. yeah. Not the temperature of the LED that produces the, the, the color. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, because it would melt. Yeah, it would <laughs> yeah, melt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, but, but when he solved these equations at the time, mm -hmm. uh, there was a problem. There was another divergence. Yes, yes. Uh, it was called the UV divergence. The right. UV catastrophe. Yeah. The UV yeah. catastrophe or the, the um, ultraviolet catastrophe. And basically, the equations were saying that the light bulb should mm. emit infinite amount of ultraviolets. Yes. Yeah. And so that was not acceptable because in the laboratory, they weren't measuring an infinite amount of ultraviolet. Um, so he tried to figure out a way to solve this. Mm. And that led to what's called Planck Law today. Mm. Right. And so let's look a little bit at Planck Law and what it, uh, what it meant. Um, well, he found that um, he had to add this constant that he called H in the equations. Mm. Um, and this constant, he wasn't sure what it was at first. Uh, it took a while before we started to describe it as, uh, as an angular momentum, right? H over two pi is, is H bar is, it was at the time of later, you know, around yeah. Iraq. Actually yeah. it was a, a proportional constant, um, uh, to describe the energy of photon. So when you have a photon with a certain type of frequency and the relationship between its energy and its frequency is the constant H. Yeah. So the energy and its frequency here, it, it's, um, in terms of a, uh, a little orbital or a little, you yeah. know, uh, term, pulsation, yeah. Yeah. pulsation yeah. right. Um, so this is important. I, I meant what I mean by Planck didn't quite know what it was. It took Einstein to describe it as a photon, mm. but he realized that like it was acting like the electromagnetic field was in packets and Einstein eventually described those packets and he got the Nobel Prize for it, uh, for the photoelectric effect, saying that these packets were were um, producing... Were absorbed by atoms, yeah. Yeah, were absorbed by atoms. And so, basically, it was later um, that it was called a photon that came with Einstein. Mm. And, but at first, Planck thought, this is really strange. It's... It's saying the electromagnetic field comes in packets, um, and it was counterintuitive. And he 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 talked about it. He, he wasn't sure this was correct, uh, but the result of his equation, and I'm trying to keep it simple, but the result of his equation, you know, kind of resemble E equals m c squared. So here we make a little question mark. Is there a relationship? Because that relationship is not clear. There was Du Boglier that uh, wrote some equations um, uh, that may relate them in its a way. Direct link. I'm sorry? It's, du Boglier made a direct link between H bar and, and the mass of the particle. Yeah. And the mass of the particle using fluid dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is, um, you know, pilot weight theory. Yeah. As well. This is the, yeah. This is at the base, at the foundation of pilot wave theory. Yeah. Right. Right. At the foundation of pilot wave theory. So the, there is a relationship, but the relationship is not fully yeah. uh, translucent and clear. Certainly not in modern quantum mechanics. Um, and so um, you know, here we have Einstein and Planck together because it kind of everybody says. Quantum mechanics was fathered by Max Planck, but really Einstein had a lot to do with it as well. Um, and, and really Einstein spent the rest of his life trying to put these two things together, quantum mechanics and relativity and general relativity, putting gravity in at the quantum level. And it wasn't clear how that would be. And uh, for the history, one funny thing is that Max Planck helped Einstein being recognized by the scientific community. And at this turn, Einstein helped De Broglie obtain his PhD on, uh, on this pilot 
not by lot wave theory at, at the time, but right. on this theory between the duality between particle and wave. Right. And between H and mass. And mass, yeah. So so the, the, the missing link, what we're trying to communicate to you right now is that the missing link is that in both cases, you've got a little thing that's spinning. Yeah. You've got something that's spinning. You've got a little, you know, two pi going around, okay? And that's kind of like making a little structure in the fluid dynamics of space-time, if you'd like. And so um, when we, when there's something else that happened when Max Planck wrote those equations, as he solved them further, he came back after publishing his first papers, he came back and said, well, actually, you know, for the equations to be um, congruent yeah. with uh, high temperature, um, I have to add this term, otherwise it doesn't work out for uh, a direct relationship to KBT or, you know, to KBT, which is, you know, the, the equipartition the, theory. The equipartition theory. Dimensions. So I don't want to get into too much detail, but basically you had to add this term, otherwise the thing didn't work, um, to be simple. And that term uh, was called zero point energy. He called it zero point energy. So he came back to the scientific community with this and said, well, you know, the equation when it actually solved for zero Calvin. So when the temperature goes down to zero Calvin, where nothing should be oscillating, there should be nothing happening anywhere. Like it should be dead, like this, like thermal death, like it, it's gone, nothing is moving. Everybody freeze, nobody moves, right? Well, actually the equation said that there was an infinite amount of fluctuations. So, the these we're talking about the basis of quantum theory here it's not it's a non-trivial thing it's 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 this term here okay uh and and, and it basically says that at the ground state at the basis of quantum theory at, at the at the very foundation of reality there is this field that's oscillating with an infinite amount of energy, like the, the equation diverges. So, so basically, in one sense, you could say, there it goes, uh, in one sense, thank you, Cyprien, it, it, what it says is that it doesn't, you know, resolve to, oh, at zero Calvin, everything is flat. It resolves to at zero Calvin, it's crazy energetic, right? And, and you might say, well, how can that be, right? How is that possible? You got to think of it. Again, fluid dynamics is a good um, analogy, right? So, so think of the ocean. If you're in a plane, the ocean view from a plane can look completely flat, like calm. You know, it's like it's at zero. There's nothing happening. Everything's flat. But if you go down with that plane and get closer and closer, you might find that actually, you know, there's six foot waves and that there is like smaller waves in, on the six foot waves and smaller waves again. And actually it's really energetic, but you couldn't tell from the place where you were observing from. Right. So, yeah. 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 It's very important. The, the, what you're meaning here is that like the scale at which you observe uh, objects in physics really determine uh, the, the, the level of energy you can observe. And uh, another thing that was very important with the zero point energy was one part, the infinite energy that it provides uh, at the quantum scale, but also it provide um, the solution. I mean, in the quantum mechanics equation, we can see that this term is essential for matter stability. Uh, mainly when you calculate uh, the stability of the operator, which describes how an atom uh, behave or how the electron behave around the atom. And uh, you realize that without this term, the, the atom should collapse. And uh, to me, it was one of the main points also of uh, Max Planck theory was to 
be able to provide a source term to matter stability. Right, so it's this uh, problem with non-commutativity yeah. uh, of the operator exactly. in the equation. So we're getting a little technical, I understand, but basically there's a problem. You cannot just remove this term, although it has been generally completely ignored, right? In general, um, I mean, it's not being ignored, it's being renormalized. Re <laughs> um, so there's all kinds of schemes in quantum mechanics uh, mm. today, um, like QCD, QED, uh, that deals with this infinite energy, deals with these infinite terms in some of the Feynman loops, for instance, where it needs to be renormalized, um, kind of like made like it's Removed not there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, put it under the carpet, we'll make it like it's not there. And um, although that's valid mathematically, in, although that, that's debated as well, because even Feynman said that it was kind of trickery and it wasn't necessarily valid. Yeah, it wasn't mathematically consistent. Yeah, it, it's not mathematically consistent, but, you know, it can be done. It's been done. It It's kind of like jumping on the biggest discovery. You know, it's kind of like jumping on the most important thing. It's like ignoring the most important thing yeah. physics could have ever found. Right, the source, yeah, like the source of energy of creation. Like this is this is this is a non-trivial thing. Like yeah. you can say, and I think it was it was um, it was Dirac that's, that that yeah. said, I, "I'm happy to ignore, you know, infinitely small yes. values, but but uh, but when you find an infinitely large value." Uh, it's not appropriate to just discard it, make like it's not there, right? And and importantly, this uh, this infinite energy at the at the quantum scale was very important to con to understand the the nature of uh, space time, and uh, and Einstein and Wheeler understood that. Yeah, and we right. have and we have a nice so illustration. Of illustration it. here's yeah. Einstein. Uh, and uh, John Archibald Wheeler uh, walking around with uh, Yukawa in the in the gardens of Princeton, and uh, we made little uh, bubbles with their quotes in it. Uh, we don't know if they were saying exactly that at that moment when the picture was taken, but these are quotes from these guys, and this is why these people said these things. This is why. Einstein said, physical objects are not in space, but these objects are spatially extended. Like an object is, is an extension of space. It can't be separated from space. In this way, the concept of empty space loses its meaning. And then they, they start laughing. <laughs> and, and then Wheeler answers, uh, no point is more central than this, the, that empty space is not empty. So we should never use the word empty space in physics. The, that doesn't exist. It is the seat of some of, uh, it is the seat of the most violent physics. And what he meant there is that it's fluctuating with so much energy. It, yeah. It's intense. And, and um, so, so in modern thoughts, in modern physics, this fluctuation of this energy is called virtual particle creation and alienation. And it, it, they're popping in and out of existence very, very, very quickly. And, and they, um, and, and so we tend to think of like wavelets on the surface of the ocean or something like that. But, but it's really important to understand as well that like, um, you know, the visualization of these physics is so critical, like the, the visuals we put in our head when we do these physics. And, and so early on, it, this oscillator that was supposed to be a little thing that's spinning, right, got changed to a, a spring that's oscillating like this. Uh, and, and it's kind of like it lost a dimension. 
and um, and and basically, if you're visualizing the thing going like this, you're not necessarily gonna gonna get the right answers. When you're thinking of all these little spinners, think of little vortices making a big vortex together. Then you might start to think, whoa, you know, maybe this field is actually are creating angular momentum or oscillation or mm. or circulation and now i'm getting giving you hints to the physics we wrote um that show that when it circulates it produces an effect we call mass and energy and it's exactly what is measured in a superfluid where we see quantum vortex vortices appearing naturally when the the whole volume is spinning right mm. right 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 so it's like space-time acts like a superfluid yeah yeah and and it has physicality and that physicality comes actually from quantum physics like it comes from the grains that makes up the big thing mm. and so on one side we wrote the equations for the big thing not knowing there was a grain and on the mm. other side we wrote the thing for the grain not knowing there was the big curvature over mm. there the big vortex produced by the grain and now we're putting them together so now you have Einstein and Planck on each side and um, and you can see um, how do you put them together well that was already found by Planck you know all the way a hundred years ago because he when he did a dimensional analysis of his equations you realize that he could produce units that he called that are now called Planck units and and these units were generally ignored in physics um, that kind of shocked me uh, 30 years ago when I when I was starting to talk with physicists and so on that like they thought of those Planck units as just cool mathematical tricks um, that define units but now more and more people are starting to realize no no these units are the only natural units you know they're they're the actual unit and I don't mean natural units in the technical term because in the technical terms um, you know physicists have a tendency to put everything equal one like h bar g you know c, uh, c and so on equal one and they, that's what they call natural units um, I, I would suggest to all the physicists out there, please, please stop doing that because it, it, it's okay to do math, but you lose the sense of the, the physics. You lose the sense of the reality of what you're writing. In any case, when you look at these Planck units, so the analysis, well, you look at the constants that are involved well you got g the gravitational constant is involved with h bar which is quantum physics and the relationship of those two with the speed of light gives you a mass which is the Planck mass which is a very very energetic mass at the Planck scale now when i'm talking about the Planck scale i'm talking about a scale that's billion trillions and trillions and trillions of times smaller than the atom so it's happening at a scale that's completely remote to us right it's it's the ocean that looks flat from from far mm. right and so we're discovering well actually you can't ignore mm. the the stuff you know the the waves on the ocean and you know i i would have i've been a surfer for a long time and and i i've played in waves and i I wrote waves, big waves in Hawaii, and you know, for sure, waves carry energy. You know, <laughs> I've had direct contact with that energy many times, uh, you know, with momentum and, you know, stationary objects like coral reefs. And I assure <laughs> you that there is a lot of energy in these waves. And so when you put the two together, you start to realize that the structure of space-time, um, the, 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 the equations of Einstein actually meet, um, uh, um, meet quantum physics. So if you take Einstein's solution or, you know, Sw the Schwarzschild solution to Einstein's equation and you, you just, there's an M term and you put the Planck mass in that M term, 
Well, all of a sudden, you get the right radius. There's a factor of two, which is a geometric factor. We don't have time to explain why that two comes out, but it gives you the right length for the Planck size, for the radius or the little spinner of a Planck. And, and thus, all of a sudden, you have a relationship with, between mass and radius that's in Einstein's equation, but that's applied at the quantum scale. And, and that's what shocked me early on, like almost 20 years ago, I was like, wow, you know, how can it be? There is absolutely no reason that should work together exactly right. Like that all of a sudden, just put the Planck mass in Einstein field equation, you get the right radius for the Planck length, <laughs> right? It's, yeah. it, it's not supposed to be related. And, and so it works out. And so physicists in general think that's kind of cool coincidence. Mm -hmm. Or they tell you everything can be written in Planck's units. Um, but, but what's important here, again, is actually extracting the physics. What is it telling us about the mechanics of the universe? And so I know I'm talking a lot. I'm in so much trouble because we're going to go a little long, but I, I, I really wanted to share this with you because I solved it in the holographic mass solution, but I solved it only geometrically. And now we have the mechanics. So I, I really want to show you a little bit of what's coming in the next few weeks, what's coming in the next few months. And I want to, um, you know, get on this, uh, you know, amazing journey with you guys. So um, I, I figured out that like, okay, well, you know, it's got a radius, it's got a little mass, it has a little geometry, let's approximate it to a sphere, and let's go with a sphere and see what we get. So like, the, so basically, I defined the little grain of space time, the little holographic grain or the little pixel of reality like i and i'm just saying our reality in this universe at this time you know they like, it could be a different pixel grain in other places but here uh for what we observe so so there's probably stuff underneath planck's uh mass and planck's length like the planck pixel is most likely made out of smaller pixels that you could call transplankian, which comes out in physics because they have this problem with infinities. And so, you know, in Hawking radiation, you have a transplankian problem where, you know, you have to get closer and closer to the horizon. You end up with grain smaller. But, uh, but at least for our universe, for our experience right now, uh, this produced the right result. And basically, I was able to extract the correct mass and the correct radius for the proton, which I predicted, and then they measured it, and it was four times small, four percent smaller than um, what they expected, and it was the prediction I had made, and so on. And so, this is really important. Um, but now we have, and now we have all the mechanics. We have like how this happens. Yeah, and it's very important to understand that with that, we, we unlock the nature of space-time. So we know the, the structure of space-time being a fluid, a plasma, a Planck plasma, and what is the size of the grain, and then we can compute the properties of this space-time, of this fluid, mm -hmm. and calculate all the consequences from the properties of this fluid when the fluid is spinning, creating matter, creating energy, charge, mm. forces. Yeah, I, I think for me it's one of the key points to unify all the forces, um, all the different uh, type of energy, because uh, at the moment in physics everything is segmented in different, different fields, uh, different forces, and uh, we don't understand really how it works together, and by defining a uh, a unit for space-time uh, was very important for us to then unify all the concepts in physics. Yeah, it, it starts to emerge naturally. Mm, yes, it's exactly. kind of remarkable. Yes, it, it starts to emerge naturally. The forces, the relationship between forces, you start to realize you can write, 
you know, Einstein field equation with the Planck force and, you know, all this starts to emerge. So the symptoms, uh, it, you know, here we have a slide telling us, you know, what is mass? Is what, a why physics is, is lost? But the, the important point is to, to see what we were talking about uh, before about the puzzle in physics. Right. And one interesting thing in particle physics, while they are kind of lost, they also find nice piece of this puzzle. For example, the Planck plasma is very similar to the quark gluon plasma that they find at the CERN doing like particle physics right. and smashing protons. Right. So they're finding these pieces. It's just they're not being connected to together yeah. in the same way. So there's, there's a problem. What is the nature of force? You know, gravity is ignored at the quantum scale or it's not found or they, they can't find the relationship in the in the formalism at the quantum scale. Um, so the forces are not unified. And the reason is because in general, this amazing discovery of the zero point energy or vacuum fluctuation, it's got all kinds of names, uh, was, was ignored. And, um, and the materiality of space time has been not clear. Like uh, it produced a force, but it's just a mathematical concept. If it produces a force, it must have some materiality. And there's a great, great uh, conference from one of the greatest physicists. Uh, uh, Frank Wilczek. Yeah, Wilczek. That uh, Frank Wilczek did a conference in 2017, I yeah. believe, uh, called The Materiality of the Vacuum. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a really good conference. Uh, if you're interested, uh, he's Nobel Prize uh, in physics, and he talks about the fact that, uh, you know, early time there was this concept of a materiality to space that got ignored and so on. Um, and then, you know, mini black holes, spin, and all this are all, you know, the fractal nature, meaning that, like, it, it, it seems to replicate at all the scales. There's a relationship between a galaxy and an atom. You know, they are related. Galaxies are made out of atoms that have made all kinds of things like stars and planets and, and gases and all kinds of things, but they're all atoms. So how do they come together? And, and this property is very important because it's at the basis of the possibility of building technologies on, on this finding because exactly. we can scale it at the scale of a, a laboratory, for example. Exactly. You know, the, the effect is not at, just at the Planck level, at the quantum level, it's actually reproducing. Yes, at every at, scale. At yeah. every scale, yeah. like vortices within vortices, within vortices, within vortices. So it stands to reason that at our scale, we can make vortices and, you know, participate in this amazing vortice or in this amazing dynamic of space-time ourself. Um, why scientific community is stuck, you know, um, you have to start looking at things in a new way, um, you know, and um, the, 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 the new way to look at things, um, you know, change the paradigm really to like, wow, we are on a limited resources uh, planet. There is limited resources, there's limited amount of energy, there's limited space, and we have to basically war to survive. To there is actually a almost infinite amount of energy. You know, there is uh, almost uh, infinite of resource, amount of resources, we, we, we event, we, we went from horse and buggy to our modern society, mostly because we learned how to control electromagnetic fields. And the next step for humanity, and certainly this is the goal of ISF, is to learn to control gravitational fields, um, which will liberate humanity to be able to travel through space, have access to almost infinite amount of resources, to be able to move goods on the planet without destroying the environment and so on. And, and so the implications are huge, although the discovery is one discovery, it's just 
how gravity works really fundamentally. Yeah, understanding space time and um, playing with space time. Playing with space time. Vacuum engineering, folks. And so basically, um, throughout the 30 years, I got to cut it short, but I would have loved to show you some of this. But this is what the path where we that went on until now. This is the path forward in the next six months is going to be huge. I'm going to be interacting with you guys. We're going to be talking to you guys. We're going to be describing what we're doing and where you guys can come in and help you know because we need help we need your support we need you to come with us on this journey and so uh, the technologies that we're going to develop at isf and the workshop so please register for this workshop it's a huge difference for us um, to be able to continue to move forward to, kind of, to be able to continue to bring this to you guys and um, and some of the events that are gonna occur in the next few months are gonna make that possible if you participate, if you come with us, if you help us. Um, so this is the workshop in English is in September 29th uh, and 30th. Uh, so it's um, one night and one full day and we'll, you know, it will be much less uh, rushed and we'll be able to get into details and have questions and answers and all this for you guys to understand. But as well, uh, we're wanting to as well have a free seminar for scholars. Uh, so professors, students of physics and so on. Um, it's going to be technical. It's just going to be jargon for three, three hours. So, you know, for layman, it's not going to be so interesting. But we wanted to make that available freely to the scientific community. Come with us. Come and check it out. Come and uh, criticize it. We want feedback from you guys and we'll talk with you guys anytime. So like come to this seminar, we'll go through the math we wrote and we're, we need your help. Uh, and, and I think you need ours. And, and I think that together we can really make a difference in the world. So um, just a few other words from our um, our administrative staff, uh, Sarah Astles and uh, Thibault um, is going to talk to you for a minute and then we'll come back with uh, Sarah for a minute and uh, in live and uh, as well with questions and answers. I know we went a little long. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to eat up your beautiful Saturday um, day, but um, I, we had a lot to say. I'm sorry. ISF has its headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, and laboratories in France. The previous laboratory, Taurus Tech, was in California, so why move to Geneva? Launching these world-changing technologies requires the ultimate strategy. Several inventors have created over-unity energy production, yet their technologies never make it to market. Stephen Greer recently did a great documentary on this subject. This technology must be deployed across all nations around the world, giving no country a strategic advantage over another. Neutrality is a cornerstone of Swiss foreign policy, which is necessary for this to happen. Geneva is strategic in that it is a worldwide center for diplomacy. It is headquarters to many agencies, such as the United Nations, and it hosts the highest number of international organizations in the world. For the past year, we have been preparing for the move to Europe, and in April, we finally packed up the laboratories in California and shipped everything over to France. Here we are packing up our location in San Clemente, California. And here's some video of our new location in France. Many of you have followed Nassim's work for years. Several of you have taken the unified science courses through Resonance Science Foundation, joined a trip, or followed him online. And maybe some of you are new to all of this. While Nassim was the driving force for decades, he is now surrounded by highly trained professional teams, both in the scientific and administrative structures. I'd like to introduce you to the rest of our team. 
starting with the scientific team. You've already met Nassim Haramain, and he's been accompanied by Olivier Alaral, physicist, and you also met Cyprian Gourmand Perez, physicist. I'd also like to introduce you to our Chief Technology Officer, Jean Philippe Genset, William Brown, biophysicist, Dr. Inez Ordineta Parada, physicist, Amal Push, affiliate physicist, Maria Carolina, astronomer, Tama Luisel, technical assistant. Now I'll introduce you to our administrative and business side. Rito Fierce, our chief financial officer. Thibaut Verbeest, our chief legal officer. Jamie Johnson, chief operating officer. Christina Bluet, executive assistant, and several others from our support and marketing teams. This merger of companies creates a symbiotic relationship among our three pillars of focus theoretical research, education of unified physics, and research and development of advanced technologies emerging from unified physics. Our educational programs include the unified physics modules, online and live educational workshops, and in the near future, accredited technical programs for students of various scientific studies, from advanced fundamental physics to biophysics, chemistry, and many more disciplines, including discoveries and research in archeology span completed at ISF and relevant to space exploration. Thank you everyone who has supported this work through your involvement and contributions over the past decades. You've helped build the launch pad that has taken us to this next level. And now, more than ever, we can use your help. In the coming weeks, we will see many announcements. When you enroll in the ISF educational workshops, it is not only an educational and transformational opportunity, but most importantly, it is an opportunity to support the research and development of the technologies of the future. And that's the first time um, that uh, Nassim is uh, calling on his community and all the people who have supported him over the last years. And what we are going to launch is what we call a perpetual bond. What is it, a perpetual bond? It's um, a way to be entitled to a share of the profits, of the future profits of uh, our organization, the ISF. And, and so it's also a way, of course, to um, contribute to the financing of our operations, of our future developments. We will also have membership and investment options, giving you the opportunity to invest in the future with us. If you'd like to receive more information about the membership and investment opportunities, go to the link provided. You will receive more information when the programs launch. It's also a way for you to become an active or acting member of the ISF. Remember, we are an independent organization and research facility with no involvement from corporate special interests. We operate with the support of all of you. Come with us on this journey and lead the world to a new way of understanding ourselves and the universe around us. We can only do this together. Thank you. I want to acknowledge our audience here today. Several of you joined. We actually had a very large audience and almost nobody dropped off. You hung in through the physics. It was wonderful. I know this makes it very interesting and easy to follow, even for the layman. Um, also in the audience, you know, this is hard for Nissan to put together because we have full range. We have the physicists, that this is their profession, their academics, this probably seems easy in the physics. We have the layman um, who's just fascinated in, in the nature of reality and everybody in between. And so some of you is probably easy, some of you difficult, but it, you really hung on. And we're the layman. I studied um, business at the University of Southern California. I did not study physics. So I can speak to the layman. I understand the, that it might be confusing to understand the extent of the confusion that's been going on in physics. Um, so I just wanted to speak to the layman for a moment. You might understand that there's been a disconnect between quantum physics, the small stuff, and the theory of relativity, the big stuff. But it goes far beyond that, the confusion in physics. Uh, there's 26 constants. You know, he mentioned E equals MC squared. So C would be an example of a constant, the speed of light. Um, but I didn't understand, I was a little naive, because again, I'm, I'm the layman, that physicists didn't really understand the nature of these constants. They didn't understand why they held the value that they did. 
I kind of thought they did, but they do not understand this. They have not understood it until now. For example, alpha, which is the, um, you know, the charge or the electromagnetic charge between the particles, something like that. Sorry, I'm probably butchering that. It's one over 137 or something. Again, I should not be speaking physics. <laughs> um, but the point is, is this has this fascinated physicists because it somehow magically works. They don't know why. And I remember it was uh, last September, I think it was September 16th, that they solved alpha. And we're gonna call this alpha day. And we're like, okay, this is, this is amazing. This is something they never thought they could do, they did. We thought we should break out the champagne. And I'm saying this to acknowledge the humility that this team carries. I'm, see, I'm looking over here because I'm looking at Olivier and Cyprian and Nassim and, and Olivier and his humility. Yes, I think I'm gonna have to think about this. I'm gonna have to let this sit. It's like, this is huge, what are you talking about? I'm telling you the story just to let you know how profound and magnificent it is what these guys have done, what these physicists have done, and how this is gonna change humanity. I, I said in my talk, this is, you know, this is a new step to humanity, and it truly, truly is. Nassim did a great job of explaining how this physics is going to lead to the new technology. And you're saying, okay, well, how's physics going to change the world? Well, because the technology is going to change the world. This knowledge is going to change the world. You know, people write to us and, and they say, how are you going to release the technology? You know, just make it open source. Mm, it's far more than that. Tesla made it open source. You have to understand the physics. The two go together. And so what we're doing at ISF is education and technology. They must be combined. We must educate the academics. That's why we're creating the um, accredited program. Imagine, you people say, how are you gonna get this, this technology out there? So many people have tried and failed. I mentioned our location, Geneva. Imagine if we put uh, the education through all the universities, through all the academics, along with prototypes. There's ways that this cannot be crushed. But for this to happen, we need your support. And I want you to imagine for a moment, and I made another statement. I said, imagine the world that isn't dependent on fossil fuels. That sounds like, okay, so you're thinking better air pollution. Uh, we're not having to mine the earth. I challenge you all, and this is how you can all help as well. Tonight, Dream about it. Let your mind expand. This is how innovation happens. This is not very far away. I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, is this for my children's generation, my grandchildren? Mm -mm. We're going to see this soon. Very soon. So start thinking about it. Start dreaming. All you innovators out there, if we passed you a technology that created energy from the vacuum of space, what could you do with that? What could you do with infinite energy? Imagine this world. Imagine how we're moving goods around. Imagine the two and a half billion people that don't have access to, to clean fuel for cooking. What is their life gonna look like? Imagine our computing capabilities. Travel, infinite travel, because now you're controlling gravity. You can get off this planet. Wherever you go, you have your power source with you. So we're no longer mining the planet. Think of what that's gonna be. This is coming quickly. This is coming very soon. And this is where we need your help once again. The workshops, they are a source of funding right now. So we have two workshops. We have the technical workshop, which Nassim explained is for, you know, the, the physicists, the academics. We have the, the workshop that's for everybody. And at the end of this, you're probably you're seeing it about right now, you're going, you have an email with a link for the workshop. We need all of you to purchase that workshop today, not tomorrow, today. This is what supports us. It's for your education and to enhance your life. And I want to talk about the education piece because I have seen this presentation go to the layman. And even if they don't understand all the formulas, it rings truth. It moves them to tears. I've also seen it presented to physicists and they're just fascinated how they cannot poke holes in this thing. It moves them to tears as well. This, this workshop is for everyone. It really is. So all of you, please sign up. And don't just sign up yourself. If you're with your spouse, each of you sign up. Sign up your friends and family. This is what's going to support us. And please purchase it today, not right before. We've told you about all we have going on with the transition, the move. We're hiring new staff. We need to build equipment. The sooner we have the funding, the sooner we can launch this. We need to get this out there yesterday, not tomorrow. So we need the funding now. So we're asking for your help. And that's how you can help us is in purchasing the workshop. 
Um, and what, what you can expect in the days to come is right now you have the email. Um, in a few days after the weekend, you're going to have the replay of this event. Um, and in the coming months, you're going to have more invitations to join future workshops, such as the, uh, the workshop that addresses the unified physics. But first, you have to watch the workshop that, that is coming up next, because at least the groundwork is like the prerequisite. So sign up for this one. And then the next one, you're going to have this, this base covered, so you can sign up for the other one. So just stay tuned to our announcements. All right, I'm not going to talk too much longer because we need to leave some time for the Q&A. So with that, thank you again, and we're going to open it up to questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Cyprien. It's been amazing. Uh, I hope you guys got something out of this. I know it was really rushed and a lot of information. Uh, I'm so excited about these next few months. So uh, stay tuned with us and, and we're happy to take questions now. I know we're running late, uh, but um, uh, it, uh, you guys have been writing questions. How many questions we have? Oh, more than 100, but uh -huh. we will pick a few of them. Uh, yes, let's yeah. pick a few and try to answer them as quickly as possible. So what, one question is, um, what? please speak to how all of this is just not another theory. Why should people actually pay attention to it? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Uh, well, you know, first of all, there is not that many, just another theory, um, that actually have made predictions that have gone true. So this is not just another theory that's been, you know, that's come up in the last few years. This is something that's been there for 30 years. It's made a lot of predictions. Uh, for instance, at the beginning, uh, I made predictions about that we were going to find black holes in the center of all galaxies as a result of the theory that's at the time it was really not acceptable to say that because black holes were thought not to exist at all um it was most physicists opinion that black holes you know was just um kind of a snafu in the equations and you could ignore that part of the equation the high curvature part of the equation so um so um then many other predictions, uh, for instance, that black holes in the center of galaxies were going to be found to be there first, and then galaxies were, you know, at the time they were saying, if we find black holes in the center of galaxies, it'll be because stars collided together and made a black hole. And that's just not the case. The black hole is the source of the dynamic that we see as a galaxy. So it's there first and so on. And so there's many other things. Um, that have come true, including one big one, which is the radius of the proton, the holographic mass that was confirmed by experiments in accelerators. Um, you know, that was a big shocker for the guy, for the scientific community. It might not, not sound like much, uh, 4% of the radius of the proton. They had it too large by 4%. It might not mean much to you, but um, quantum theory is usually measured with some 10 digit to 12 digit accuracy. And so 4% is like being in another galaxy. <laughs> if you're, if you all of a sudden, uh, the standard model of particle physics is undergoing large difficulties to explain this 4% smaller proton. Um, and although uh, and, and this is actually the value that's given by CoData, the standard of physics now, nowadays. Um, so there is difficulties that have not been resolved about the radius, the proton, um, and, uh, and these theories um, resolve them. So this theory resolve it. And, and so this is more that can be said for string theory or 
you know, any other unified field theory out there that has been trying to put things together. And so this is kind of emerging as, as the, the, the fundamental theory uh, that, that will unify physics. And, you know, the math and the details are coming out very soon um, to give you all of the details and it's consistent. Yeah, and I think another important point about this uh, new theory is not that we reinvent physics. Mm -hmm. We just find a, a link between all the major results in physics. And and for me, it was very uh, astonishing to, to see those links and to see, once we have those links, how we are able to invent new technologies and to use it um, to create the... yes. New, a new better tools. future. Yes. Yeah. What did you want to say? Uh, I, I mean, to create a better future yeah. for the for humanity. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's you know, uh, for sure you can always be skeptical and say, well, you know, the it could be just another theory. I, but you have to consider in your logic as well that uh, eventually this you know, just another theory is going to be the correct one. <laughs> and the, this is most likely very much so it, because when you'll see all the papers that are going to come out, you will see that it's consistent on all scales, for all forces, and for all constants of physics. And that is not anything, any other theory, including the fundamental theories of physics we have today, like general relativity and quantum physics, is able to do. So, so this is a very much a deeper layer of understanding of reality. And very importantly, the theory is coming with applications straight away, mm -hmm. which is very different from all the other theory trying to unify physics. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like string theory, which is, you know, can have... Uh, 10 to the 500 compactification, you know, geometry and, you know, doesn't tell us mm, anything about reality um, in, at, at the fundamental level. Another question about technology it's, uh, is going like this. How far do you think we are of being able to extract energy from the vacuum at such rate, or at such rate and cost that we can get rid of fos fossil fuels? Fossil fuel. Um, the, um, you know, I think that um, that is really uh, a very difficult questions to, question to answer um, because it's difficult because it's kind of neurotic in the, the answering, meaning that that was found over a hundred years ago. <laughs> this all kinds of things, and if you don't know the history of it, um, go and watch on Amazon uh, the movie that was just released by Stephen Greer called The Lost Century. Yeah. And uh, he goes through the history of Zero Point Energy Inventors and all the things that happened around it and, and everything. And you'll see that actually, you know, from Tesla and before Tesla, uh, there was already inventors that were finding nonlinear effects that, you know, where energy was coming out of some field that they didn't know about and so on. And they couldn't explain in physics. So in general, it was discarded. Um, so, um, you know, uh, how long is it going to take? The question is more, how long is it going to take until um, the, uh, until the um, the uh, social, political, and uh, military industrial complex uh, allows this technology to to emerge. I think that this is actually on the verge. I think that uh, people and um, I don't know if you're following the stuff that's going on at Congress these days with you know, talking about UAPs and all these uh, phenomenons they're finding in the atmosphere and so on. And I, there's a lot of disclosure that's occurring and there is a lot of um, reason, stressors on our society 
for this type of technology to emerge and the theoretical structure that holds this technology so that we understand what we're actually doing is critical. Without it, it cannot emerge because it, it's like uh, it's like magic and, and you know, science doesn't do magic. It, it has to have some kind of conceptual construct of why this thing is doing this thing. And so this is why it was critical for me 30 years ago already, we couldn't just go for the hardware. We had to understand the physics and, and then develop the hardware, you know, with really amazing uh, roadmap to get to it and to get to it in a way that it's very powerful. And do you think that humanity is ready to receive such a, power, a powerful source of energy? Right, that's another really difficult question. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have the pretension to be able to make a judgment on humanity. Uh, I, all I can say is that I think humanity is changing very rapidly. I'm very enthusiastic about the way humanity is changing since the last few years, since all the difficulties that have happened. I think people are realizing, okay, there is something behind the curtain, we have to get deeper uh, and when we have to unify, people are unifying, you know, although if you look at the five o'clock news, it might feel like we're more split than ever. Uh, I think at the deeper level, I think we're going to pass this stage and, and realize our commonality and realize we're on this little teeny grain of sand in the universe flying through space, you know, at incredible speeds and like we're all unified in this journey and we need to unify our efforts and bring that together. I, I'm, I'm enthusiastic, I'm, I'm hopeful that humanity will make that step and, and, and it really doesn't have a choice. It's like happening now or humanity is going to have to do the great recycling that the universe is quite capable of doing. And so, you know, this is when it's happening and it's happening with you guys, like every one of you out there, every single one of you is making a difference. Um, what Sarah was talking about, like imagine it and it will come and, and we need you to imagine it, to act upon it, and to help us get this into the world. And another question that many people are asking is, how this knowledge in physics could help them in their day-to-day -day life? Right. Well, you know, uh, there's, there's all kinds of aspects to that as well. You know, it's like from, from just realizing that we're bathing in a field of energy and we're starting to work with uh, William Brown on, on biophysics and showing that this energy is actually at the source of the organization that eventually produce a biology, the biosphere, the fact that you're here and I'm here and we can talk to each other may be the, the sourced by this energy itself. And, and, and so that like, we're actually emerging from that field. And so to know that we're interacting with a field when we didn't know we were interacting with the field before, uh, all of a sudden puts a new dimension, <laughs> literally, in your reality, you know? And, and, and strangely enough, it joins dimensions of reality that were talked about by masters and and all kinds of ancient civilization that talked about this fundamental field. So it kind of connects like some deep levels of philosophy and, and so on. But, but as well, uh, you know, what it changes in every, in, in, so, so wake up with that. Wake up with the connection to the field. Like wake up in the morning and say, hi field, you know, like connect with the field, be with the field and then and then throughout your day, when you forget about the field, get back to it. You know, take a moment, two seconds to just say, okay, here, you know, I, I'm interacting. Like all these atoms, all the stuff around me, it's all part of this amazing will works of nature. 
and then eventually as well of course the technology will completely change your life um you know when you can go to uh, orbit jupiter for the weekend uh, your life will be completely transformed when you'll see the earth from space or you know when you experience the universe from a completely different perspective so it will have deep seated change in your consciousness for sure there are so many many questions but i, I don't know if you want to take one more one um, more one more yes uh are you okay to talk about business or sure yeah one question of business People are asking, is it possible, really possible to invest directly in your company and being part of this project and being able to like, uh, yeah, join the journey as an investor? I, I will answer that question. Um, Thibault mentioned briefly a bond we have coming out. The reason why that isn't out yet is because there's a lot of legal work behind it. We're having fun and reviewing the legalese behind it right now. <clears throat> it will be available in a couple months. But meanwhile, there's other ways you can help. We will be uh, announcing a membership program soon that has a, a monthly contribution amount or annual. Um, but even right now, we have a Contact Us page on our website. And if you're inspired to help financially, non-financially, absolutely, um, non-financial examples, maybe, maybe you have a lot of connections to uh, universities, um, a lot of connections to... Um, to impact investors, that when we do have the bond release, you can introduce us. Uh, maybe you want to help financially in another way right now, um, bridge loans, anything. We are, we are open to um, many ways for involvement. Um, if you're the best of the best in your field, you know, send us your LinkedIn. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We are looking for top notch. We're not looking so much for, for internal volunteers just because we're looking, um, but we are hiring the best of the best if, if you would like to contribute in some way. Um, so there's many, many ways you can get involved. But number one is the Nature of Reality Workshop. If you could purchase that today for you and your, your friends and family, that is an immediate help as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And, and, and if you're a scholar, if you're a physicist, a uh, scientist, uh, so on, uh, send us um, your interests, what you'd like to discuss, or you know, uh, anything you want to um, contribute and so on, and, and we'll look at it. and. We'll try to include as many people as we can, as well, you know, relationship to uh, research uh, groups and universities and so on. Uh, we are in the middle of like your resources, the resources you give us will help us actually launch all this and we really need your help to do it. One more question. That's it. That's it. That's it. I think it's been an amazing two hours. <laughs> Sorry, we gotta let people have their beautiful Saturday. And I'm I'm really um, um, grateful that you've all been there, that you've listened to this, that you're participating. And I'm grateful for your opinions. I'm grateful for your criticism, whatever um, comes, um, you know, I really want to engage with you guys and and go on this amazing journey. We have an amazing team. We have amazing uh, capacity to get the job done. Uh, we need the fuel and we need your support from all kinds of levels, uh, from your capacity to connect to the field to helping us with finances and so on. So thank you so much for your time. And until we connect, which won't be too long, uh, may the vacuum be with you. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, you guys. Thank you.